Hi, welcome back to the course. In the last video, we did a brief introduction to who I am as your instructor, and then also we talked about the modules we're going to cover in this course. So if you haven't watched that video yet, go ahead and pause this one and just go back to it so you understand kind of where we're going with this. In this video, we're going to start off our discussion with the basic information. So we're going to talk about things like why you should even become a penetration tester, different uh, prerequisites that you want to know, and then also things like black versus white versus gray hats. So a quick pre-assessment question for you. What's another name for an ethical hacker? And I kind of gave it away with my last little video there. All right, so if you guess penetration tester, answer B, you are correct. Uh, black hat hacker and criminal hacker are synonymous. And then gray hat is someone that's kind of on the shady border area there, right? So they, they don't really have a criminal intent, but they might uh, write software to fix systems that aren't their own, or they might hack systems that aren't their own to find vulnerabilities. So what is penetration testing? Well, it's commonly called uh, ethical hacking by EC Console, but everyone else in industry actually calls it penetration testing or pen testing for short. So why would you ever want to do this? Well, you see the screenshot here. This is kind of an, just an average uh, salary for pen testers in the United States. Um, and I can say that the people I know doing pen testing are making well above this number here. Um, and of course, that varies based on your area, uh, you know, part of the country, and even the country that you're in, right? Some countries is very, very low pay. So it just kind of depends on where you are on what you might be able to make. Now, keep in mind, though, that even if you live in a country where they don't make a lot of money or they don't pay well, you can still do things like bug bounty programs and potentially make a lot of money. So penetration testing has a big job growth, right? So one, one figure I found was 18 to 28 percent. I think that's pretty on the point there. Um, there's a lot of organizations looking for consultants or you know penetration testers to go around and work with clients and customers. It will benefit you if you happen to be in the United States. If you're willing to get a security clearance, that's going to open up the, essentially the world to you, right, as far as here in the U.S., of job opportunities so you can work at the federal level. So just keep that in mind. If you're going to work as a penetration tester and you're willing to do a security clearance, that's a really good route to make a really good amount of money. So again, I mentioned the salary range. Uh, generally, again, everyone I know is making over six figures, but it depends on where you actually live at. And then you also get some good, you know, feel-good type of stuff, right? So you get to help protect companies and people. And then flexibility. Most of the time, uh, you can work from home or you can work remotely or you get to travel around and meet different people. So some of the prerequisites you probably want to have before you actually start this course and even before you actually go to try to attempt the Certified Ethical Hacker exam is you want to understand some basic networking concepts. So things like the OSI and TCP IP model, um, a basic understanding of networking of, you know, what a switch is, what a router is. We're not going to cover that stuff in this course. Basic understanding of operating systems as well. So how to how does the operating system work? How do you know Windows machines work versus Linux versus Mac OS? Basic security concepts will help you immensely. Just understanding even just some of the terminology. And also a basic understanding of mobile because that's a, a lot of the uh, the exam stuff on different certifications now is focused on mobile and even eventually uh, it'll turn into like AI or a blockchain and that sort of stuff. So the penetration testing methodology, um, it is listed in the official EC Council material, but I don't know that they really um, hit this too hard on the exam. Again, I can't tell you what's on the exam. Uh, but basically, we do reconnaissance, so we're gathering information about our target. We then perform scanning, so we're trying to find like some viable systems, right? Some servers maybe, or maybe some weak workstations, a web server, that sort of stuff. Then we gain access somehow. So we find a vulnerability, and we exploit that to gain access to the system. We want to maintain access, so we drop a rootkit or a backdoor, and that allows us to stay there doing whatever we want to do. And most of the times that's stealing data. And then of course we want to exfiltrate and cover our tracks so nobody knows we were actually there. So black hat versus white hat versus gray hat, um, and you'll see gray spelled with an E like this or with an A as well, depending on the, the thing you're looking at um, and the country you're in. But basically a black hat is going to be our criminal hacker, right? So there's usually some kind of financial motivation and they don't really care about like who they're harming. They just want the money, right? You got your gray hat and they're kind of uh, that in between, as I mentioned, you know, they, they're generally a good, good hacker, uh, but also they might touch systems that they don't actually have permission to. Um, and there was one example in the media a few years back where a gray hat uh, noticed a lot of home routers were vulnerable, right? So he wrote a, he or she wrote a, a script to fix that issue and then pushed it out on the internet to fix a lot of devices. Uh, but that's, again, that's a gray hat thing, right? Because you technically didn't have permission from the owners to do that, but it was a good thing. The intent was good. And then you've got your white hat or your ethical hacker or your penetration tester. Um, a lot of different hats on that one there, but essentially that's your hacker that has permission to actually get into the system. 
So our different box testing. So we've got black box, white box, and gray box. So a black box is going to simulate that outside of the best, so your criminal hacker type of thing, and it's going to go through that entire process. Uh, you've got your white box testing. That's going to be more of uh, kind of your uh, user level. Or excuse me, not your user level, but your insider threat level. Uh, pardon me on that. And so, you know, someone that knows about some different servers in the network and maybe some other systems or maybe has some, you know, admin passwords, that sort of stuff. And then your gray box is more so of like your user level um, type of person that they, they got some access to the network, but they don't really know anything. You know, maybe it's that, that janitor or something like that. So that's kind of what they are. And even though they're an insider threat, they just don't have a lot of information. So that's kind of, kind of why they're more so a gray box. So identity and access management, um, we're just going to touch on this real quick just because it's something that you will see uh, in the official material. So basically, at a, in, in the nutshell, it's giving pe the right people the right access at the right time, right? And so we do that through different management systems. So we can use a, a central repository, um, like you might see, like, you know, uh, uh, Active Directory and Windows. Um, and basically, it allows us to set by, you know, particular role. So this person's working as a network administrator, so they get this, this, and this. Or, you know, rule-based, you know, anyone that is in this group can do this. Um, even uh, different remote, remote authorizations. If you're a remote worker, you can only access these things. It also can offer things like single sign-on, so we know it's actually you, stronger authentication methods. Um, we can use uh, password management as well. Um, so just a lot of features in identity access management. So red versus blue. Now I'm actually a college football fan, um, and here in the U.S., uh, so so American football. And uh, I, I like the Michigan Wolverines, and the Ohio State Buckeyes are like their biggest rivals. So uh, the Buckeyes are red color, and uh, the Wolverines are actually blue. So I thought this was a good analogy and screenshot here to use uh, to explain this concept. So red versus blue team. You'll hear that out in penetration testing. Essentially, your blue team is your defender, right? So your defense. And your red team is your offense or your offender. So the, the red team is trying to score that goal. They're trying to get in your network and do something. Whereas the blue team is trying to prevent them to come out. So in this football example here, you know, Ohio State, the red color there, they're trying to get a touchdown. They're trying to, you know, get points on the board and beat me. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm Michigan. I'm, you know, I'm trying to defend against that. I'm the blue team there. So I try to figure out ways to block their attacks. So in a nutshell, that's what it is. You're, you've got attackers and defenders. So the CIA triad, um, not these CIA people. We don't want them uh, coming after us for taking this course or anything. I mean, I definitely don't want to be in a no-fly list. That's no fun. But we, we want confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So confidentiality, we want to make sure only the people that need to know about this information can access it. Integrity, we want to make sure the, the information is actually valid and not altered in any way. And then availability, we want to make sure that the people that need this information can access it whenever they need to. Authentication and non-repudiation. So authentication, basically three concepts that you'll you'll know want to know in industry. Um, something you are, so that's something like you know your fingerprint, your you know your iris scan, whatever that is, some kind of biometric usually. Something you have, like a badge that you scan at your workplace, and then something you know, like your password. And then we've got non-repudiation. So basically, I can prove, you know, I or whoever can prove that you actually did see that send that email and that it came from this person. So physical security, um, and basically this is the plan, steps, and procedures to protect your assets. A lot of people think it's just like putting up a fence or a security camera, but it's actually procedures as well. Like, you know, do we do we stop people at the door and question them before they just walk in here? Do we allow piggybacking or tailgating, which we'll cover later in social engineering? You know, th those types of things. So it's got three components, physical measures. So things like we can touch it, we can taste it, you know, we can basically feel it essentially. Technical measures for physical security, like smart cards. And then operational measures. So that's our policies and procedures. And then we wrap up here with uh, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. So um, this is not, not so much a newer thing. It's been talked about for several years now. Uh, but basically the, the concept, at least uh, with this screenshot here, is we're trying to make it easier on our analysts, right? So our, our cybersecurity analysts or information security analysts, we're trying to make it easier on them. So all, you know, there's literally thousands, if not millions of logs coming in. And so the AI, what it can potentially do is it can look at different behavior indicators that we program into it, and then it, it uh, you know, essentially says, okay, well, it's flagging these, and then it adapts to those, right? So it notices, like, well, this doesn't look right either. Let me, you know, flag this, et cetera. And so basically, eventually, certain things get back to the analyst to view so they don't have to look at, you know, thousands of logs. They can just truncate the data and look at the things that are flagged by AI. Now, whether this is going to actually work properly or not, kind of kind of needs to be determined uh, because some organizations do have some components of this in use but um, but from what I hear it's not the greatest yet so um, so it's probably going to take some time to get those kinks worked out 
So in this video, we covered a lot of different things. We talked about why you should become a penetration tester, some of the prerequisites you'll want to know. We talked about the difference between a black hat, white hat, and gray hat. We also talked about things like the CI triad and authentication and non-repudiation. So in the next video, we're going to jump into the different laws that you're going to need to know if you decide to work as a penetration tester, and definitely if you decide to take the Certified Ethical Hacker Examination.